Welcome to Mysteries of Superstition Mountain. I'm Larry Hedrick, where we bring the past into the present for our future viewers. Today we have another great story by Hank Sheffer. The depression of the 1930s was devastating to an awful lot of people in this country. And because of it, stories like Jacob Waltz and the Lost Dutchman Gold, uh, the lost Jesuit treasures of, that were supposed to be in catches all over the mountains here, and the lost caves of gold bullion and gold bars that were supposed to be buried here in the superstitions of Arizona were all over the place. And people were looking for free gold somewhere. All this unclaimed, all these unclaimed riches that people could find, they were going to look for that. And the depression was driving that in, in great measure. Well, the people in Apache Junction uh, weren't all that much different than anybody else. They had a neat place to gather here at the Apache Junction Inn that was at the main intersection of the Apache Trail and, and the highway. It was down where the first zoo in Arizona was first located. And they'd gather in there and they'd tell their stories about gold, lost gold and lost treasure. And then they'd go out and they'd try and find this stuff. Well, the first guy credited, or blamed for, I guess, uh, looking for the first couple of caves of gold bars, was a fellow by the name of John Hallenberg. Now, he, he had said that he had a map. Of course, everybody had a map to somewhere. But he had a map, and it took him out to Bluff Springs Mountain. And he found this ledge, and he was walking along on this ledge, and he come across a hole in the ground. And the first thing that he said to himself was, I gotta crawl down in that hole. That wouldn't be the first thing I said to myself, but that's what he did. And he crawled down in that hole, and lo and behold, he saw all these writings on the wall. He knew they weren't petroglyphs, but he said they must have been Hebrew or something like that. It was some foreign language. He didn't know what it was. Well, he come back up out of that hole and he come back and he was telling these cohorts stories about that gold. Of course, he couldn't ever find that hole in the ground again. And this was one of those stories that our friend Tom Collinborn used to call a one man story. It was told by one man and it was only one man who'd ever seen it. And so it was a little tough to, to confirm whether it was true or not true, because nobody could ever find it again. Well, that's the way it went for old John Halliger, Hallenberg. Then there was another fella. There was another fella by the name of James Baxter. And James Baxter, now he was, he was a fella that was up there running around up uh, between the Superstition Mountain and Garden Valley. And he said he found his entrance to a place because there was a blue light that emanated from the entrance of that mine or whatever it was. And he went in there and he discovered all these gold bars worth millions and millions of dollars. And he came out and he come down and told his friends about it. In fact, Bob Ward, one of the old time mountain men that lived here for years, he confirmed that story was true. Of course, he also confirmed that he'd never seen the mine, and he confirmed that he'd never seen the gold bars either. Didn't sound like much of a confirmation to me, but that's what they said, and that's what they was all talking about, these gold bars. Well, old James went back out there looking for that mine, and you know what? He never could find it Apparently they turned the blue light off, so he never found an entrance again. And he wandered around in the desert for a couple more years until finally he just made his way back to his home state of Washington and we never heard any more from him. And that was the end of James Baxter. Well then, well now there's some other fellas. Now these fellas, they, they were avid believers in the lost Jesuit catches of treasure that were supposed to be in the mountains. And over the years, 
Many, many archaeologists and historians have proven beyond any shadow of a doubt that that just wasn't true. But they believed it. And they, there was Ernie Province, uh, a fellow by the name of Carl, Carl Howard and uh, Tracy Hawkins, and they'd gone up in that area and they found some gold bars that were actually part of this Jesuit treasure that was part of this cats that they found. Well, by golly, they each got a bar. They each had one, and they had pictures taken. Once again, Bob Ward said it was true. He saw it. It must have been so. And they took pictures of this, and they had all of this evidence, per se, and they come down, and they were telling everybody about these gold bars that they had. Of course, they didn't have the gold bars with them. And somehow or another, they were never able to find that hole in the ground again. And somehow or another, all the pictures got burned up in one of the fellow's huts. So the pictures disappeared too. So we really don't know what happened with that. Well, that was bad enough. And it gets us around to one of the, the more elaborate stories talking about gold bars. You can never leave out Crazy Jake. Because Crazy Jake, I'm here to tell you, Robert Jacob was his name. And he didn't do anything halfway. And he had this, this place, this mine or hole in the wall that he talked about. It was out by the squall box. And he maintained that there was $20 million worth of gold bullion bars that he had. He even told the newspaper people that he'd take them to this place and he would guarantee that he would show you these bars. And he had all these people that he talked to and he got them to invest in this gold that he would, he would pay them back on their investment down the road somewhere between 90 and 120 days later. Somehow or another, that never really came to pass, the payback part. And even taking the, the news reporters up there, it got to a point where it was so difficult to get to this place that by the time they got to the last stretch of the trail, they were climbing up this hill that was kind of like, I won't say it was steep, but your toes would hit the ground the same time your nose did. So it was pretty steep stuff. And they were all tuckered out by this time and they just said, we're not going up there anymore. So Crazy Jake didn't have to worry about showing them nothing. They'd leave, he'd take them back, and they'd write the stories. Well, as it went on, Crazy Jake actually swindled, I've heard everywhere from seven million to $30 million. I think he went to jail over seven. It may have been a little less than that. But from all the swindling that he did of these people, by golly, he went to jail, and that's where he wound up. Well, I've told you these stories so you can see that there's people been chasing after gold bars and treasure all these years. But my favorite story is the one about Lydian Perrin. Now, Lydian Perrin is one of those legends that has all the things that you'd love to have in a legend. You have an Indian girl who lived in the mountain. You have an Indian girl who knew where there was a treasure trough of gold bars. There was an underground river that flowed under the mountain and went up to the canyon lake. And then we had, we had all these Indians that were around them. So you had all of these elements in the story that were just grand for sitting around a campfire and telling. Well, it turned out that Jim Hatt was the fellow that did the interview in 2010 for a magazine, and he was interviewing Walter Perrin, who was Lydian's grandson. And he told the story about his grandmother who'd been born in 1860 out around the Weaver's Needle and Blacktop Mesa area. Uh, that doesn't really pinpoint that, but you'll be able to see on our map where she was actually born. Now, as the story goes, 
She lived out there for the first 10 years of her life before moving out of state, getting married and all that good stuff. But she heard these stories from the tribesmen about this cave that was full of gold bars and that they were guarded by the Apaches. She was Cherokee Apache, and the Apaches were in charge of guarding all of this gold that was down in this mine. Well, it finally got around to the point. She was 10 years old, and she finally was able to get down and see it. The tribes people came to her and asked her if she'd like to actually see what these stories were actually all about. Well, of course, she jumped at the opportunity. And as she told her grandson, he was 12 years old at the time, as she told him, they lowered her down into this place and she was in this big open room. And in that room, she was walking down this aisle of gold bars that were as high as her shoulders. Now, bear in mind, she's 10 years old, but if it's that tall on both sides of her, as far as she could see in that room into the darkness, stacked with gold bars, uh, that's a pretty smart amount of gold that's down in that hole. She also said that there was another chamber that adjoined that one, and you could walk through that, and there was this beautiful lake that was down there. And it was a deep, clear water lake. But on the left side of the, of the chamber, there was a ledge. There's always ledges, if you hadn't noticed already. But there was a ledge. And you could walk on this ledge because it was only about a foot deep there where the water was on top of it. And you could walk on that ledge all the way to the back of this chamber. And on the wall was this large geode that was embedded in the rock. And that was some sort of an omen or it, it guarded the Apache is what it did. And it was embedded in the rock right there. Well, she came back out and they pulled her back up out of that hole and she finally left. Well, as she was telling the story to her grandson, Walter, she told him that it was his destiny his destiny to go and find that gold. And at that same time, she gave to Walter the other half of that gorgeous geode that was embedded in the rock and told him that it was his obligation, his responsibility, that when he put those two geodes back together, he would be able to have all of the Apache tribes come together um, under um, one umbrella, if you will, and he would be in control of all of the Apache tribes. And that's the way that went. Well, time flew by, I guess, uh, as Walter spent his time growing up, uh, and he finally got to the point where he was a young man, and he had aspirations of his own even though he knew about this gold mine that could have made him a multi, multi-trillion billionaire or whatever, uh, he didn't bother with that just then. He had some ideas. He was going to go to Florida and open up a karate studio, a martial arts studio and, and bodybuilding studio. He had a fellow that was going to back him with all the financial aid that he needed so that they could open up that that gym with all these people, Kung Fu Luian and all that good stuff. Well, it turns out he wasn't much of a businessman, so he left there. As he said, he got out of Dodge. And he went right up into, of all places, Ralston, Georgia. Well, he met a fellow up there that offered him a job. And this job was going to pay pretty good if he was willing to do it. And he said he would, because apparently the pay was pretty good. But it turns out here again, he's working for another fella who wants him to do something that's really not all that legal and not going to make him all the money and rich as he wanted to be. 
as rich as he wanted to be, he's going to be driving bootleg whiskey. He's a runner for Pete's sake. Makes me want to sing a song about Thunder Over Thunder Road or something. But that's what he was doing. And he got to the point there that he owed this other fellow money because apparently he was playing little games and selling stuff on the side that wasn't really his to sell. So now he's got to leave Georgia too. Who has to leave Georgia? Well, Walter did. And what he got to thinking was, there's got to be a way to make money that's not going to be quite so detrimental to his life and limb. And it dawned on him when the light went on, how about that gold from his grandmother out there in Arizona? There was all that gold bullion out there down in a hole in the ground. And he could go out there and find that. So he come back out there, and he met a couple other fellas. And they, they decided that they would work with him and help him out with all that good stuff. Uh, a fellow by the name of Carl Broderick and John Coombs. Um, and apparently they bought hook, line, and sinker into this gold bullion thing because they were willing to help him do just about anything. And one of the first things that that Walter asked him to do was they needed to get this V8 Ford motor and an 85 gallon compressor up to the area where this gold was supposed to be. Well, I just learned recently that they actually did have some roads back in there, such as they were, so they weren't packing this motor on a horseback or anything silly like that. Uh, these guys probably would have done it, though, for Walter, I'm thinking. But at any rate, they got that done, and they were out there looking around and looking around, and they were up there around that Blacktop Mesa area. And they looked, and they looked, and they looked, and they couldn't find anything. And old John Coombs even got to the point, he went up and he marked on the mountain, he put his initials up there where they were headed and where that gold was supposed to be. And they came back down and they didn't have any gold. And they went and they looked and they looked and they went all through the 60s, through the 1960s. These guys were up there looking for this gold. There was even one expedition where Walter Perrin had 12 other guys with him, plus these two, and they were out there looking. And to give credibility to this search, they actually took an archaeologist from one of the colleges or whatever was going on, and they took them up there so that would add credibility to their, their search for this gold bullion and gold bars. Well, they never found it. They never found a thing. Walter finally kind of gave up on it, and he, he went back to his home. And Walter Perrin was actually a pretty good inventor. He, he invented a lot of things for handguns. He had quite a few patents with that, but we don't want to get into that right now. But at any rate, Jim Hatt now, he's, he's the one that's doing this tale. He's the one writing the story. He asked him, he says, well, you have the map, you guys were up there. He says, did you actually ever find anything? And Walter wouldn't be real specific, but what he said just kind of tickles me. He says, well, we just weren't looking in the right place. Just like we used to say about X marks the spot, either the X is in the wrong spot or the gold's in the wrong spot. Well, they never did find it. And up until his death, in 2008, Walter never did disclose any of the real information that he had found out there, if in fact he did find anything, because he always maintained that he was just in the wrong place, and if he went back out there again, he'd probably be, be able to find it. Well, I don't know about that, but what I do know about is that there are still people who are really dead sure that there are gold bars in caves up on this Superstition Mountain. 
And I'm also equally sure that there are lots of people who are still out there looking. And as long as they're out there looking, I know there are people like Crazy Jake who will be more than happy to take all the money you have to help you go find them. As it turns out, as far as I'm concerned, right now what we have is just one more mystery of the Superstition Mountain. Thank you for watching this episode of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains.